happy to welcome you to COSI today. Conversations on social issues is something the library holds here in Library Room A every Thursday because, because we see it and we say things are hard to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So whether or not you agree with every single thing that you hear today, we want to have a collegial and respectful conversation so we can learn and grow from each other and expand our worldview. So, a quick plug for the books that we have up here. All of these are available for checkout, so if you were here and you are doing research on this topic, then go ahead and feel free to peruse these, grab it, check it out if you'd like at the circulation desk. At the end of this, I'll ask you to fill out a very brief survey, asking what you liked, how we can improve, and what you'd like to see in the future. The answers on your survey really do impact what I seek out and the speakers I seek out for upcoming quarters. So, if you are passionate about a topic and would like to speak, come talk to me. I'm already starting to think about fall quarter schedule. Right. Next, in two weeks, we'll have Tracy Lai, Melanie King, Kaylee Hoka, and Takami Nieta for all Seattle Central College faculty. And they'll be talking about Asian American women reclaiming history, place, and identity. But today, I want you to join me in welcoming Mario Cristiani. Did I say last night right? Correct? As we discuss gun violence and why assault rifles aren't the problem, please join me in welcoming Mario. Thank you very much. How's everyone doing today? Good. 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 Cool. So uh, I don't know if you saw, but when the when Kimberly sent out the emails at the beginning of the week, I had a survey attached. Um, did anybody in this room happen to is one of those respondents on that survey? No. Oh, sure. A few. Well, thank you very much. It helped kind of tailor what I plan to talk about today, so it was definitely useful for me to get a gauge on what some of the people who were going to be in there really thought about what was going on. So uh, today, as the presentation says, it's about gun violence, and my focus wanted to be on why assault rifles weren't the problem. And uh, it's kind of a charged statement when you hear it at first, right? Because I'm sure, as most of you know who read the news and have seen some of the events in the past couple of years, that that seems to be counterintuitive, right? It seems every other day we have to read about some mass shooting in a school or a mall or a church where someone walked in with an AR and you know took out a bunch of innocent people. So, but uh, I want to kind of spread a little bit of light on that and talk about how while we see that a lot, that is not the main cause for most of gun violence in the United States today. So a quick sort of just explanation. Um, data on this subject is really hard to gather. There's not one national agency per se that is responsible for collecting any of this. So. It kind of comes down to being able to piece together different statistics from various sources. Um, the three that I've used today are the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, FBI, and then the Gun Violence Archive, which is a nonprofit that has spent a lot of time gathering various um, studies and they try to track each individual incident. Uh, so it was the kind of a surprise to me. The FBI. Um, does a really nice breakdown of how felony homicides are committed, so what the cause of death is in those, so that's where I pulled most of those stats for. What was a shocker that I didn't know was apparently not every murder is a felony. So that was kind of cool and an interesting piece that I picked up. So this, and then the CDC only breaks down um, mortality in the United States and what the causes of that are, but they don't give a sort of detailed description of piece by piece, which would be a lot. Um, so understandably so. Uh, also, data points are all from the year 2015, so it's not as accurate as I would like, but it was the only year that I could find all of the points matching up. Um, and hopefully we will not be talking about numbers the whole time. I know it's dry, but have to get through it right off the bat. So for the year 2015, this is just a brief breakdown of some of the more important stats on the year. Uh, a total of 36,252 people died from injuries related to firearms. 65% of those were suicides. Now, I'm not going to be discussing suicides as much um, because if you look at it from a global perspective, there's not a correlation between high gun ownership and suicide rate. So there's evidence to suggest that even if we do ban guns, that won't result in a market decrease in suicide in the United States. Um, so we're kind of just going to push that aside, although that does account for a huge percentage of firearms related death. Uh, so with that in mind, that equates to about 13,500. Uh, homicides using firearms in the United States. That's not a nice even number like the first one because again, uh, the data is slightly conflicting as well as inconsistent, um, but that is pretty close to the average between the three sides. Um, these stats are on the rise. Uh, while crime has gone down in the US, murders with firearms as well as firearm related suicides have gone up in the last six years. 
part of that is due to just the growing number of firearms in the United States. It's about 330 million, so almost 1.2, or uh, I think, sorry, it's above 330 million, so it's about 1.2 firearms per person in the U.S., which has eclipsed the rate of cars per person in the U.S., um, which is also an interesting statistic, because probably everyone we know has a car, but not everyone we know has a gun. Um, under 18, there were 3,393 victims for the year 2015. Um, so those are, that included um, school shootings as well as domestic issues and then just, um, you know, various other incidents, sometimes bystander, but just any time that the victim was under 18. Um, and so when we look at it, the 3.4% that I have up there as a result of rifle, of homicides committed by rifle, is a breakdown of the FBI stats, um, but the FBI stats only extend to about 10,000 murders. Um, so that means the other 3,000 are either not tracked by the FBI. I'm assuming that's because they're not felony murders, but I don't know for sure. So that's why that has kind of that little asterisk, is that that's been extrapolated on to some of the larger numbers as well. So I don't know how much that could vary, um, but from what we do have, that's what it looks like. So my goal for the rest of the presentation was to also give a um, kind of an honest look at a comparison of gun-related homicides throughout other causes of mortality in the U.S. I think that there is a lot of talk about how much of a pressing issue this is, and I think that that really relate, comes down to how much people remember, right, mass shootings, is that it kind of sticks with you for better and for worse, but it's, uh, it's definitely not an easy concept to forget. But if we map um, those numbers across to other causes of fatalities in the U.S., and these are not, none of the four uh, that I have listed here are a leading cause of fatality in the U.S., um, but so 23,455 cases of infant mortality reported, about 57,000 people died from poisoning in the United States, and another 55,000 from drug-induced causes. This number has spiked dramatically in the past two years with the rise of opioids, especially in the Midwest and uh, southern part of the United States. So I don't know off the top of my head, but that number has increased by a fair bit um, in the past couple of years. And then 4,300 people die every year from underage drinking, which is also a large number that I was shocked to find out about. So those are kind of a representation of some of the other causes of death in the U.S. And as you can see, they, with the exception of the first one, almost all of them eclipse the corollary standards for gun violence, which I think is contrary to a lot of what people may have thought off the top of their heads. So before we move on, um, I want to talk about assault rifles a little bit. So I was wondering if anyone in the audience give me a, a definition of what they think an assault rifle is. Here. Uh, assault rifle is a uh, what is it? Well, I mean, with a pistol grip, a removable magazine that holds more than 10 bullets, and something else. It's a weird description. It's so I think that that is state-specific descriptions mm -hmm. as to how they would regulate banning sure. a weapon of that um, make and model. A lot of those are either attachable or removable features. Yep. So, right, you could have an assault rifle, or by the the Merriam-Webster definition of an assault rifle that we'll look at in a second that doesn't necessarily have any of those features. Yeah. Any other ideas? No? Thank you, though. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the answer. Um, so they have this long, lengthy definition of what constitutes an assault rifle. Mm -hmm. um, various to intermediate range is often a sticking point because you have long-range rifles designed for hunting are generally not you know, you can't really use it up close just because of the size and weight is one example, as well as their capacity to hold um, bullets or rounds is just lower. It's usually about five to seven, whereas you can have removable magazines like the um, guest up front mentioned that has 10 plus, right? You just don't see that in a long range hunting style rifle. There's no need, right? If it takes you 10 shots to hit the deer, you're probably doing something wrong, would be my thought. Um, so with that in mind, this definition of an assault rifle is pertinent to almost any rifle that's sold in most stores with the exception of hunting like we described earlier. So a magazine fed is um, 
is on almost everything. You even have magazine-fed shotguns as well. So the magazine-fed is a really common feature that's on most rifles sold in the United States. Um, the resemblance of a military assault rifle is, uh, is another interesting concept because as years have aged, so have our firearms and our firearm technology. So what we know as hunting rifles today was military technology 60 years ago, right? Pre-Vietnam War, World War I, World War II, before automatic weapons were deployed as, a, you know, as the bread and butter of the United States military. So that definition is new in the sense that it would not correspond with what time it's been like in the past. Um, the designation for semi-automatic fire, though, is uh, accurate. It's incredibly hard to get any gun that is fully automatic. And uh, I guess we can cover that right now. Does anybody know what semi-automatic versus full automatic means? No. So a semi-automatic weapon is one like a handgun or a pistol. It can also be a tap, or it can also be a rifle. And what that means is, if you pull the trigger once, that will fire one round. So the amount of times you want to shoot corresponds with each pull of the trigger. A uh, fully automatic weapon, like what you would find uh, in the military, or in some cases what the SWAT team and police and other law enforcement agencies have, means that if you pull the trigger, it will continue to fire until the magazine is empty and you have no more ammunition. So that is not very easily available to civilians for purchase. There's a lengthy process including additional background checks, a tax stamp, I think it's $250. Sure. There's also a bump stock, you know, which came into prominence after the, the Vegas shooting. Where, yeah. You know, like a semi-automatic is not as good, but nearly as good as a fully automatic rifle. With a bump, with a bump stock. stock, yeah. Bump stocks decrease accuracy by far, but it effectively uses physics to turn it into a semi-automatic, or I mean to a full automatic, um, just with the way the reco works into your shoulder compresses the stock so you don't have to pull the trigger multiple times. It's kind of a long physics explanation, but the, that is true. Um, and I think that there is a, uh, a House bill right now in the United States House of Representatives to remove bump stocks, as they should be. If we're not going to make fully automatic weapons available to civilians, we shouldn't allow tools to turn them into. I think that's a fairly straightforward line of thinking. Um, so this is uh, an AR-15 which stands for Armalite, not Assault Rifle. So everyone here can leave today knowing that AR does not mean Assault Rifle. Um, this is the most common firearm in the United States. It is a, um, the selection of both hunters as well as competitive shooters, people who like home defense. And if you're looking at it from a gun perspective, it's well built, it's effective, it's not effective, it's not super expensive. You can get it for fairly cheap and uh, it's also a fan of um, gun aficionados because of its customizability. Like we discussed earlier, right, you can add the pistol grip as seen there. There's a detached magazine that's about 30 rounds. Um, it's got an adjustable stock, which is not the same thing as a bump stock on the back. Adjustable just means you can extend that length, so it's not up close, it's a little farther away from your body, uh, which is legal everywhere. Oh, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not legal in California, but until the latest round of uh, uh, statewide gun Adjustments, uh, adjustable stocks were pretty common on home-built rifles. So the other example, or the other mainly owned firearm in the United States are pistols. So the one on the right is a Glock 19, the one on the left is a uh, Tech 9. Did I say that right? Did I write it right for you? Okay, sorry. Um, so though both of those are also semi-automatic, same thing we talked about. One pull of the trigger fires one round, right? And you can repeat that process until the magazine is empty. Obviously, you can't attack, you can't attach a stock on those. The mechanics of the gun just don't work like that. So bump stocks would not fit on a pistol or a handgun. Um, but what is look, what I think gets looked over really simply is that the advantage between a pistol and an assault rifle is range, right? Assault rifles provide a faster bullet that can just go much farther while still being effective. Um, as far as use goes for police in general, past 25 yards, anything with a handgun to neutralize a suspect or to um, just to be able to aim at that distance is not effective, um, which is why we've also seen an increase in rifles being given to police officers in case they have to engage a suspect in a space of over 25 yards. 
you know, if they're coming out of a car or it's moving, I mean, you just can't get accuracy with a pistol. Um, however, we have seen pistols used in mass shootings, just not as of late. The, previously, the deadliest mass shooting in the United States was the Virginia Tech one, um, where I think 35 people were killed. That assailant was armed with two pistols of that size, and at close range, it's just as effective as an AR, uh, an assault rifle, anything like that. The Tech 9 on the left was in Columbine, which was one of the first school shootings and by far the most received popular, or notoriety, I should say, instead of popularity in the United States. Um, lately, it's just they've fallen out of favor. There are studies from psychologists that suggest the main reason that people pick ARs is because of the copycat effect and that according syndrome. It's just that everyone else who's had the same idea is using an AR, so why shouldn't I? Um, but in a crowded room, like a classroom, or the Pulse nightclub, or anywhere, other situations like that, the Sutherland Springs Church shooting we have seen in the past, all of those, a pistol would provide the exact same um, effects and damage. The AR really only provides advantage at range like we saw in Vegas. Um, there are strong indications to suggest that these are not people who have been, or that, uh, I think there was an FBI study who suggested that they were not lifelong gun owners and uh, sort of gun, like I said, aficionados earlier, and so that a lot of this is just this what everyone else has, so you can use the same thing. So now this is where the debate starts to get interesting, because on first glance, right, would people categorize that as an assault rifle? It's more like a hunting rifle. Looks like a hunting rifle a little bit, right? It's made out of wood, you don't see that pistol grip that we saw, the stock is not adjustable. But that is a Mini-14, which fires the exact same round that an assault rifle does. It just does not have a collapsible stock, it doesn't have a pistol grip, but it does have a detachable magazine. I think that this one is a very small one. You can sort of see it jutting out of the bottom right here. I think that means it's because it's California compliant, so it's only a 10 round magazine, whereas a 30 would extend further out. Um, so that's a little bit of image trickery, but that is a detachable magazine, so you could get larger ones for that as well. And at the moment, that is defined as an assault rifle because of the features we talked about earlier, but that is fully California compliant, and that is, uh, in effect, the exact same firearm as an AR or an assault rifle from the, from the standpoint of round size, um, semi-automatic, like reloadability, all of that. So that is a well thought out um, design. And that also was old military technology. We used that in the Vietnam War, or a, a markup of that in the Vietnam War that was slightly larger for them to be able to carry. But this would get around all gun control laws and it would still be considered old military technology. Uh, how are we doing so far? Are there any questions or any clarifying points? Thank you for bringing up the bump stock in the back. I forgot about that. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, no, sorry. Um, um, I so, have a, I had a thought on, you know, so you presented numbers, you know, earlier mm -hmm. about, you know, how many from gun shootings and, you know, um, alcohol, you know, drug overdose. Um, I think there is a missing point in those numbers because, you know, even though the numbers might be more or less than the other, with gun violence, you know, because you have taken all the suicides out, you know, it's always violence inflicted on somebody, which is like not, you know, um, like I might do drug, you know, I might die of, you know, drug orders because I'm doing it to myself. Sure. But that's not that, you know, a gun violence, you know, those numbers are, you know, for people, you know, who had no say, you know, in what they were doing. And Correct. they still died. Agreed. So, you know, even though the numbers, you know, might be less than, you know, what you were quoting before, you know, that critical point of like, you know, choice is missing, you know, in, in yeah. violence. Yeah. My, so, my response to that would be, can we agree that most, or uh, that all drug overdoses are accidental, right? Those wouldn't be categorized as suicides, so. Yeah, yeah. So, I think the, the point I'm making is that if you compare the people who died from drug overdoses to the people who were murdered by guns, the amount of people that accidentally died doing drugs is vastly superior than the people that were intentionally killed by someone else with a gun. No, I agree with that, and I think what I'm saying is that, you know, if you say that, how many, you know, if I'm, you know, running around, and, you know, holding people, you know, by like injecting drugs in them, I think that's sure. what be, you know, equivalent to what you are saying. Sure. Fair enough. So, that kind of breaks down at least my statistics um, 
for the conversation. So I'm hoping to move away from numbers a little bit now that we've got kind of a good base of line to follow. But uh, the point of the conversation today was to talk about gun violence and what we can do to help solve problems. So there are a number of um, solutions that have kind of been flouted lately as a possible, you know, not necessarily a compromise, but a way to mitigate the effects of guns and gun violence in the United States. Uh, those include the gun buyback and ban, uh, first popularized in Australia, uh, I think in 1995. Um, since we've had uh, a string of some pretty deadly mass shootings lately, that that has been thrown out as another idea. Others are talk about the gun show loophole, which, uh, can anyone explain that? I think you can just lock it and buy one at the gun show. Can you just, like, you get around a lot of the state's, like, background checks and stuff like that? No, you have to still have a NRA uh, card. You can't just go, like, you're on a member, but those memberships, they're, uh, they do their own background checks. Is it like buying it online or something? Like, people, like, a lot of different sellers are, like, selling it online and, like, not checking the requirements? A little bit of all of those three, if that makes sense. Um, the the background check is a federal requirement. So if you are a federally licensed firearms dealer, um, as any like gun shop that you would walk into is, the background check is required. Now there have been reported cases of people who, you know, run the background check or don't care, or just kind of bypass it. But that is not um, a significant course of the missed background checks. The gun show loophole refers to that in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction, there's not a background check required, right? Like if I if I try to sell you my gun, I don't have to do a background check because it's from one private citizen to another, it's not for business. It's a bill of sale. Yeah, it's a bill of sale, right? It's like if I try to sell you my snowboard, right? I don't need to explain to anyone why I'm doing that, right? It's just that's what I'm doing. So the gun show loophole refers to private sellers in gun shows who are not a federally licensed firearm dealer, where they could then someone can purchase a gun from them without having to pursue the background check. But that only applies to a hand-to-hand -hand transaction. So I couldn't start a company and then sell firearms without giving background checks. So that's what the gun show loophole refers to. And um, some people have suggested closing that. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that that may be effective, but as that is already um, Hand-to-hand -hand transactions are supposed to be tracked now, but the problem is that there's not enough officers to enforce it, as well as that it's really difficult to report the crime, right? Because you have to be there in the scenario, and it's all kind of like a drug handoff, right? Hand-to-hand, -hand. the only way to really enforce that is to find someone, except that, wow, if you were to buy heroin from someone off the street, that is illegal, right? Owning a firearm as long as it has been paid for and properly registered at some point is not. So you can't be stopped effectively in the aftermath for saying that this was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction because it was done legally. So that's the gun show loophole. Um, another is kind of going off that is expanding background checks and the gun database at the moment. Uh, the Sutherland Springs one in Texas is a clear example of where that has failed. Right, the Air Force had plenty of data, including an inhonorable, a dishonorable discharge. Um, from the service, so he should not have been allowed to purchase a firearm. Yet he was. Since then, I think that was in October of 2017, or maybe November. I think it was after Vegas, um, but I don't recall off the top of my head. Since that date, as of March, the Navy has submitted 4,000 incomplete records for people who are not allowed to buy firearms. Um, so that is kind of a growing example, as well as the uh, House of Representatives passed the NICS Act in Washington, D.C., um, which has closed that and is now going to enforce severe penalties on federal and state agencies that don't comply with submitting that sort of information on time. So that's a little bit of quick action for you. And then um, the final solution, or not necessarily final, but the most popular that has been also talked about in the last couple weeks is a ban of assault rifles. Um, now, with that one, as we saw earlier, there's a, there's a textbook definition of what the assault rifle is, but there's not a clear-cut definition of how that applies to people, or not people, applies to firearms outside of that clear-cut definition. I picked one off the shelves that would have been evaded by the current definitions of an assault rifle, but still has the same functionality. 
Uh, and moreover, as we talked about earlier, um, they equate to about 4% of homicides. So while by cutting back on assault rifles, we would remove a lot of the um, visceral events that stand out in our memory, right, that we can point to and show as a dramatic failure of gun registrations in the United States. But at the end of the day, the level of gun violence is not going to be reduced dramatically. The majority of murders in the United States that we see each weekend are not committed, or er, I'm sorry, they are committed, but they're not shown, right? They're not on the news. We don't immediately you see when one happens in a high school, right? But there's gangland violence, there's standard crime, there's domestic events, there's all kinds of other situations that still result in fatalities that you just don't have, that we don't see quite clearly because they don't have that sort of national attention grabbing headline. Um, so there's a huge amount of violence that is just not correlated or even directly related to assault rifles. So with that in mind, um, what are some ideas that everyone else has? I think what you said about uh, the Navy and them like supplying, there's a, I'm, I was in the Navy and there's a lot of dudes that were on my ship that should not have had a gun like within six miles of them. And these are military members. If you go to a place like Wisconsin, if you show them that you were a prior military person, they will give you certification to be a concealed carry or someone who has a, that is able to do that. Like that's completely unreasonable because I would say probably realistically 50% of the people that I served with do not need to be carried again. And I'm not saying that they had, it's like, it, like I said, it was Navy, so a lot of it wasn't even like combat related. It's just like, it's a lot of responsibility. It's a ton of responsibility. Sure. And to just give it away on like someone's like previous history without actually like even just service level just looking at it is crazy. Mm -hmm. So also prior military army uh, and I agree. Um, I I've served with so many people who even after six weeks of rifle training would look down their barrel to see what was wrong. Uh, so in in your opinion, um, I'm a member of a, of a club. Called range, range. Anyway, uh, if you show prior military, they uh, don't require you to take any of their classes, which was cool for me because you know I've kept up my training. But I mean, if you're, you know, if you shoot rifles only in the military and then they give you, you know, a handgun, I've seen people drop their handguns. It's terrible, and I just think the the first step in, I mean, we don't need to ban assault rifles. We need to ban you know, make sure that you know people are all getting their training. You want to mm -hmm. still carry, you get your training. You know, you have to go to your classes. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the military really dropped the ball on that guy with the dishonorable discharge. So. Yeah. Long history of should not have had yeah, any access exactly. to anything remotely. And I think that, that should some people should be the fire under the butt to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Anyone else any ideas or thoughts so far? I think spreading awareness. I think what you're doing today is awesome. I think spreading awareness is huge. I think mean, both sides, both sides of the argument tend to have people who just want to like plant their feet in the ground and not talk about anything mm -hmm. at all. So I think I think awareness needs to get spread in order for any progress to get made on anything. Thank you. Um, yeah. Isn't there also a problem not just with like the military not reporting stuff, but like different states not updating their information into the federal database, that seems like it could also be fixed? Yeah, for a long time, um, private companies and other industries weren't allowed to track gun violence. Um, it was just considered a non-issue, um, and so it wasn't given the proper care it probably deserved to check the gun violence. Um, maybe they have something that they can share with them? <laughs> um, so, that is a big part of the issue. Since in the last couple of years, there's been an uptick in both private organizations that track, especially nonprofits, as well as from the federal level tracking each individual incident. Um, so I think a lot of that is just a holdover of states and organizations not used to being able to having to submit that kind of information. Um, hopefully, they start to do so because that seems helpful, at least to have a federal database of understanding who's not allowed to own. You know, various um, 
guns and rifles and stuff like that. So I think that's a good point. Um, it also should be fairly easy to fix in the same way by just saying report it or you will you know, be charged with criminal negligence. Uh, how many people have shot a gun in this room? How many of those of you who have not shot, um, would anybody like to share why? I know for some people it's just not being born in the U.S. where guns are just not a thing. Um, so that could be a big part of it. Is there any other reason? Yeah, You just don't need to because someone else has it? Yeah. That's good. You trust them? Yeah. <laughs> good. That's a good step. Anybody else? Okay. Why? Well, I, I, oh, sorry. I didn't see it. Well, uh, I shot one before. I shot mm -hmm. one. It was more so like, I think like a lot of people were against guns, so I didn't really have access to one. Like, I just shoot for recreation. Mm -hmm. So it was just more that a lot of people just didn't want to carry guns, so I never just was someone who would like, teach me how to. Yeah, I, it was the same thing for me. I grew up in California. I lived there until high school, until I moved up here. And uh, I didn't shoot a gun until I was 17 because my mom was just not interested in them. And I never spent any time around them. And California is very anti-gun um, on most standards, so they kind of, uh, they don't induce fear, but they definitely try to throw out that we don't need them for any reason at all. And I think that um, that's really detrimental because there is no exposure, right? Like you, you, no one is afraid of a car because everyone drives a car, right? And part of that is just you've been exposed to it, right? You've seen it your whole life. And that also should give you at least an inherent amount of respect for a vehicle, right? Because you shouldn't text and drive if you do, don't do that. But, you know, you, we don't drink and drive, you shouldn't text and drive, you're supposed to have two hands on the wheel, right? It doesn't help to have all kinds of distractions around you when you're driving the car. And it's the same thing with a gun, right? It's that, but when we pretend that they don't exist, right? Or, you know, California kind of lives in a bubble that maybe the rest of the country does that, but we don't. And it not only breeds misinformation, but just an inability to, of understanding of how something like that even functions. So, like she said, you know, it's just, it was just a long time before I even handled one. And was your family, they carry guns here? Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. For how long? Um, probably, probably before, I was, before, before I was born, my mom and my dad. Both of them? Yeah. That's interesting. So, um, with that in mind, there's a couple of other, not um, house bills, but ideas being tossed about in the committee. So, uh, I'm, one that I really like, or that I'm a huge fan of, is creating a sort of, similar to the driver's license system, but a federal program in which people can obtain a license, but they have to pass through, you know, whatever it may be, 10 hours of class, both out on the range and in a room on a test, like a piece of paper, because there's physical statistics that you can understand as well as the physics and mechanics in addition to just being able to know how to use it. Right, the, any time you operate uh, a tool or a piece of machinery, right, it helps to understand how it works and not just like what you need to do to use it correctly. So I'm a huge fan of that one, of just promoting healthy awareness while also making sure that people are certified to use all of the pieces that they need. Right? I don't know if it's necessarily a good idea to just allow people to walk in um, to a store without ever having touched a gun and walk, you know, and then go on the five day late waiting list or whatever it is per stadium and walk out. That seems to be poor strategy. Um, so uh, that's my idea and that's my support in the house. Has anyone else heard any other ideas floating around? There's kind of a lot going on, especially with the anti-gun control marches and Yeah, I'm kind of un unaware of, you know, talk, like you keep hearing on the news how easy it is to purchase a gun or uh, what you're talking about. But when, it, you know, when I purchased one, I mean, I remember I had to go through class and all this other stuff. So where are these loopholes 
or who are these people just you know making these accessible for people without taking these safety classes or, or you know safety classes or when to use electrical protection. Sure. Because a lot of people don't understand that, you know, even if you protect you know, you're protecting your own house and the person's leaving out the door and you end up shooting because you're so scared, you know, you know what to do yeah. you in the situation, you can actually go to prison for that. Mm -hmm. So I always thought it was really important that you have these classes, but you know, I keep hearing that it's so easy to get a weapon. And I'm not familiar with that at all. Where did you purchase yours? Um, after I got in the Marine Corps, or while I was in the Marine Corps in San Diego. Yeah, in California. Yeah. So California standards are much higher than the rest of the state. In Washington, uh, it has to be bought from a federally licensed firearms owner, and then I think it's a 10-day waiting period before you can go back and pick it up. Um, and they'll run the federal background check like anywhere else. But you just have to pass a background check, wait the 10 days, and then you can walk out of the store. You don't have to show proof of completion of classes. Um, there's no... Uh, and then like a valid ID. But that level of detail is specific to California. Um, and I would argue that that's probably good for the rest of the country. So we're just having a problem like, uh, like uh, getting a process and uh, basically piggybacking off of California's process. Yeah, state to state standards are different, is really what it is. It sounds very specific. Like, so I bought my, uh, my firearm in California. All they taught, taught me was I'm a private military, so I had experience with it as well. Right. Pirate Navy, but when I bought my fire, my handgun in California, all they made me do was take a test, the treat never keep keep test, and then ten days to identification for place of residence, and that was it. That's all I got. So I think that was specific to certain situations, and everything. You had to take a class. Well, I bet that cl well the class actually incorporated that. I mean, you can take further classes if you're interested. Yeah. You know, but you know because I was probably military too, yeah. extensive training. You know, different kind of weapon systems and stuff like that. that maybe they, you know, was it voluntary there, or did they say you had to take it to the Um, the test I took. Yeah. Um, and then I, I can't remember. Really, this was in the nineties. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, and uh, I, I remember going to the class, watching the video, and I, you know, I just looked at it as, man, this is basic knowledge that yeah. everybody should know. So I kind of assumed that this is this was a process. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not a federal baseline what the state wants to enforce and the level of uh, detail and you know, how adept they are handling the gun is just not, there is no standard for that. So it's uh, it's unfortunate because for people who are responsible, right, like you or like him, you know, who do know what they're doing and they're walking out of this house and they say, oh yeah, this is, this is something that I've spent the last five years doing, right? it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. We were talking about uh, Bill and the right now. Is there a number for that bill, or? Uh, which one? The NICS Act is, has already passed. Okay. That, that was the one about making sure that federal agencies um, have to give their information and documents to the proper databases to bar people from buying guns. That was in direct response to the Sutherland Springs shooting at the church. The, what you're interested in is creating that uh, continuity Oh, oh, that was for an idea that has been suggested would be a licensing system similar to what is DOL here, right? Department of Licensing, California. DMV. So it's just an idea; it's not an actual bill yet. Oh no, no, there's not very much in the committee, um, with the exception of banning bump stocks is the most one, as well as some other background changes. Um, but there's not a bill yet that has been proposed. Yeah, because there's a lot of people who are interested in getting into the gun industry and just don't have the time or the time to get into the gun industry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I got a lot of school to get through first, but <laughs> it's, uh, I would like to. I think it, it strikes me as a win-win situation, right? Because if you're the NRA in a, sh in a shooting range, you can offer these classes and make money, and you don't have to deal with, or I hopefully we would have to deal with less people who don't know how to handle guns. So it strikes me as a, um, as just a kind of a no-lose scenario, right? Like I don't know how giving people more information Especially paying something like that, but no, there's not a there's not a book I read an article that said uh, uh, Japan made it like super super difficult to get to get firearms, and one of the as aspects of their process is they like go 
do a background check on your family too. Yeah, they do psychological evaluations. That's huge. Like, the, I imagine there's a lot of people who were involved in these shootings that if you were to go talk to even their parents or their siblings or their, God, their grandparents or aunts, uncles, they'd probably be like, nah, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, there'd be something. Like, yeah. It's just crazy that there's no questions asked whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some cases, like California and stuff like that. But I don't know. I guess I guess what I'm saying is that I agree with you that like, if you've been to a range, they harp on safety like crazy right. because no one there wants to get shot. Everybody wants to enjoy the hobby that they have and they want to go home. So it's all about muzzle safety, and muzzle control, and stuff like that. And like, if you're safe, then I don't see a problem with it. But if you're like, yeah. If you're, if you're a maniac, then how do you, how do you know? How do you prevent that? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, countries like Australia, you know, where they have banned the sale of guns completely, mm -hmm. and, you know, how, like, mass shooting is, like, not a thing there. Like, I think something happened, like, 95. a few days ago, you know, where it yeah. was, like, the first thing in, like, 20 years. Yeah. And well, why okay. that model is, like, you know, not fit for America? Uh, I think there are a number of different issues. The first being that Guns and gun culture is so ingrained into the United States' way of life that I think that to try and even attempt to do a gun buyback is just is just not feasible. Um, someone suggested, I want to say, a House representative out of California um, to do a gun buyback, like Australia, I think it was like last week, and he suggested a um, a cost of up to a thousand dollars per gun. Now that would piss anyone off who has. Um, uh, a rifle, because a lot of those are over a thousand, especially if you put the time in to build it yourself. Um, so that's already a low bar for someone who give their gun back. Is one option that, or I mean, is one hurdle to overcome. The second is I think there's like 180 million rifles in the United States. So multiply that by a thousand. That's a lot of money that we have to shell out just from a mere financial standpoint. And then the third issue I have is my problem with gun buybacks is. Someone who turns their gun in during a gun buyback is probably not the person I'm worried about, right? Anybody who's using a firearm illegally is probably not worried about whether or not they need to turn it in. Um, I think that you could see a long-term effect by just not having that accessible to anyone. So the people who do have um, like a mental health issue or just you know want to inflict as much damage as possible, you would prevent them from getting any firearms while also taking away from everyone else. But um, I think that's a small percentage of our issues. Mm -hmm. Right, a lot of the crime it's you know pure criminal. Like, why do you care whether or not the gun happens to be able to? Did you have a question as well? Sorry. Yeah. Um, did you finish? I guess the support of your statement why assault rifles uh, are aren't the problem. Mainly because they account for three point four percent of violent crime. So if we ban all assault rifles, that leaves us with about ninety six percent of the murders still on books. Yeah, I guess it um, uh, it seems to me that if any assault rivals are you know contributing to the you know that are used in these, these cases, then it then it's part of the problem. Oh, it's part of the problem for sure. Yeah. But if we say we're going to ban assault rifles, and that amounts to a four percent reduction in homicides, right? Then we should really ban pistols too because they account for ninety six percent of homicides. And I think that that's just that's a much harder challenge to tackle because then we're back at the same place where we started where we're trying to take back every gun in America, or almost every gun in America. But, well, but the I, point on that is that, you know, like if like 10 factors which just contribute to like 3%, all of them go away at the 3%. Now all of a sudden you have like a thirty percent, you know, problem which everybody is like, oh, we are just three percent of this problem, so maybe we should not be banned. But then like, you know, when you combine it together, like, you know, it becomes like a big problem. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you're no, saying that you know, you like, that? Sorry. so if assault rifle just said it's just like four percent of violence, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, a different factor might come and say, oh, we are just like three percent of the violent crimes, and you know, somebody else would say, oh, we are just five percent of the total violent crime. So when you add all this up, like, you know, all of a sudden you have like ten percent of the total violent crime, which you know we haven't done anything about because you know it's composed of three small factors. Sure. So I think what he was saying was that you know, like, as long as you don't like you know attack everything and not only big things, you know, that small problem is still going to be there. Sure, you're talking about like an incremental reduction by adjusting right. one thing to take them. Absolutely, I don't, I don't have an issue with that. I just think that it's hard to say we need to ban all assault rifles, right? Because there's so much 
more deadly than everything else, but they commit such, or, you know, they're responsible for such a small percentage of what we're dealing with today. Right, and I think that's why I think the title probably is like, why, you know, just assault rifles are not the problem. Yeah, yeah agreed. Yeah, I also think that, like, when you look at, a, you know, 3.6% or whatever it is, I mean, if we were to look at it differently as, and, and figure out actually how many lives that that was, we might start to think of it a little differently. Like, oh, maybe mm -hmm. this is just a small part of the problem, but it's, it's a part people. of the problem. 900 people. Yeah. 900. 8,900, yeah. Kind of depends on the year. Um, it <coughs> fluctuates very much. So that, that specific 3.4% that I said was specific to the year 2015. Um, I would imagine that to be higher nominally um, in the year 2017 uh, or 2018, right? So 2017, um, there were a couple of large mass shootings. Um, the Vegas was the biggest in history, so that adds a new step to the curve, right? So that's a, that's a pretty dramatic increase, but they're also inconsistent, so um, that number does fluctuate. But in comparison to homicides by pistol, it is still extremely low. So what I'm hearing is, even if you justify for uh, the Vegas shooting, let's say that you know assault rifles kill 1,500 people a year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, by your own numbers, you know over 3,000 uh, kids die a year mm -hmm. from alcohol poisoning. It's like saying we should ban alcohol. Because yes, these that's kids are dying. that. That is a point I use in private conversation, only from the sense of that. I bet almost every household you've been in has a bottle of alcohol, right? But probably most don't have a gun, and uh, you know. And I think that's where the choice part comes in. Like you know, somebody can go and buy alcohol and like you know be harmful for themselves. Yeah. But you know, like gun violence, you know, has that choice yeah. missing. You know, it's like imposed violence on somebody. Sure, it's of not course. Like, you know, it's, it's yeah. you know, gun so violence it's, is not voluntary. So it's not the same point. It's it's a different point. You know. Sure. Yeah, I think I two over here. Sorry, I stopped looking. Yeah. Outside. So you're touching on the basis of the statistics from um, because media is so prevalent now. Yeah. That uh, mass really there's barely even change of mass uh, uh, violence from the 80s, 90s until now. That uh, it, the increase or whatever hasn't really changed since then. It's just we know about more because the media attention that it gets. Yes and no. Violent crime on the whole is down. Past 35 years, I think, um, but technically, mass shootings and gun violence are on the rise. So, what that suggests is that while there's less crime, more crime is being committed with guns. Um, so, it's a little bit tricky to kind of balance that factor because we are seeing less violent crime as a whole, but but guns are committing a higher percentage of that violent crime. Does that kind of answer what you're asking? Yeah. Um, it was just interesting to me because I was listening to you guys talk about statistics and it's always in the, it's just interesting to hear people throw statistics out there and then all of a sudden when you put it in the perspective of the number of people that lose their lives and you're able to remember that we were talking about people's lives yeah. instead of just a small statistic, then you can really say, yeah, it would be great to take assault rifles off the market even if they are a small statistic statistics because they kill almost a thousand people a year. Sure. And so it, it would be worth it to consider doing that to save that number of lives. Mm -hmm. Because that could be like mom, dad, child. Right? It's a lot of moms, dads, and child. Yeah. Right? And what benefit does, do we, are we serve, like how are we served by having more assault like rifles in the general population? Oh, you're served by having assault rifles in the people who know how to use them. Right, I know like just introducing mass numbers of assault rifle, I think, is benefitless, right? There's, there's no added benefit to that. But to have um, a, I don't want to say a group, but just have a contingent where we can, you know, strictly control how people are allowed to use them, right? And if everyone can meet the standard and can use it responsibly, then maybe there's not a problem, right? As you would see with automobiles. Although I can, you know, I admit that a car is far more useful than a gun. I've never used a gun in my life or I've never a car in a day, right? So there's that aspect of it. But I think that um, they're fun for one, so I like it to be able to go to the range and they're also effective in their ability to defend your home, to defend other areas, you know, so I don't, don't need one on the street for sure. Um, I mean, the benefit is just that you have people who are in that area. 
And I think a lot of it, as we said earlier, comes down to the fact that they're so ingrained in the United States as a cultural level government. I don't have a good answer to you if I were to start a new country, why I think it would make sense to give everyone an assault rifle, but they're here now, and we have to deal with them. I think that there are advantages to having them in the hands of certain people. I think I saw one more hand over here, and then we have to wrap up soon. We can start wrapping up, but we can get okay. those questions. Yeah, uh, I just have a question. So if I get a like, license for uh, carrying arm guns, here in, in Washington State, mm -hmm. and if I go to California, do I need to get, like, and when I'm bringing it, do I need to get, like, a renewal? Yeah, there were some suggestions from the White House, and there have passed with the Senate, too, for what's called reciprocity, which means that if I get one concealed and carry license, it will be applicable in every state in the United States, but that did not pass. Okay. Um, or, I don't know if it didn't pass, it never, I don't think it actually ever made it to a vote, so, that hasn't been discussed on the national level, um, but at the moment, no. It's insanely difficult to get a concealed and carry license in California. I know people who have been on that list for 18 years and still don't have it. Whereas Washington, you walk in, they think it's from June, but another background check, and you can walk out.